<laughs> I'm just finishing off a big tri flag yeah. blanket. <laughs> so <It's> beautiful. <laughs> I thought awesome. it was appropriate. <laughs> right. Um, okay, welcome everybody to this uh, joint venture of the Thai Network and the LGBTQIA plus reading group. Um, I, my name is Carolina, I, my pronouns um, uh, are she and her, and I'm excited about today's format of this seminar, um, which is in form of a book club, um, or a journal club, better. And um, obviously everyone has read the paper, um, <laughs> but in case that's not the, uh, that's not the case. We have um, Emily Nordman um, here, who will give a short overview to ease everyone in to the topic and um, the paper. And I'm going to just hand over to her. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so my name is Dr. Emily Nordman. My pronouns are she, her. I am a senior lecturer here at the University of Glasgow, um, but I run the, um, the reading group along with uh, uh, Lisa. Um, who is knitting in the chat and excuse me I'm over two screens which is why I'm going to keep looking uh, in different directions. Um, so just a, a quick note on the reading group. Um, so we meet once a month and the format is, is fairly loose so we, we meet and we read something um, and that tends to be either an academic paper or we have also read um, there was like a, a zine version or a book chapter and, and kind of different things. Um, and the theme is just something that's related to, you know, LGBTQIA plus issues. Um, and, you know, if it has a psychology bent, uh, even better. Um, the group is open to anybody. Um, so uh, we do have a Microsoft team that you can join. If you'd like to uh, join, just uh, let me know either in the chat or send me an email. Um, but I'll also, I'm going to start advertising the events uh, with Eventbrite uh, more often because I think Carolina actually knows what she's doing when it comes to organising these things. So I'm going to start copying her. Um, what I want to um, just set up before we begin is that the, one of the reasons that we wanted to start the reading group was, first of all, to give people a space to discuss LGBTQIA plus issues and papers um, and to give, you know, queer people in, in the psychology community a chance to, to come together and, and get to know each other as well. Um, but we also want it to be a safe and educational space for discussion. So the approach that we take is that we want you to ask questions. If you are here because you are here to learn more um, and you're perhaps you're not sure about things like terminology and, and language, which is it, it can be a minefield, even for people who are kind of, you know, really in and amongst the community. Um, please ask. This is why we're here. We're here to be educational. If you say the wrong thing, we will correct you and we will explain why, but you're not going to get jumped on. OK. Um, we have a zero tolerance approach for prejudice, and I do have my remove button, um, but that's a very different thing. So if you are, you know, if you do have questions, please ask them. Um, and I would ask people who are kind of, you know, knowledgeable in the group to please respond with that kind of educational uh, mindset as well, because it is the only way that things get better if we if we educate. Okay, um, so <laughs> I'm I'm going to assume. Uh, that nobody has read the paper. That's that, that's the baseline from which I have started, um, or at least uh, very few people uh, have read the paper. Um, so what I'm going to do is, um, first of all, I'm going to start off uh, by uh, just going over um, a few um, terms that are, are relevant for the discussion, and then I'm basically going to present the paper. So I've got a few slides on, on each section, the, the rationale, methods, results, uh, and discussion, and then I have um, uh, a section uh, and then basically I'm going to open it up for discussion. So at any point, if you would like to put your questions in the chat, please do. I think what I'll do is I'll just do my presentation bit and then open it up um, at the end. But if you kind of got any thoughts on the go, then please do put them in the chat so that we can uh, have a discussion uh, when it gets to uh, that point. OK. Um, so this is the paper, uh, Breaking the Binary, Teaching Inclusive Conceptions of Sex and Gender in Undergraduate Science. It's by Lucy Mercer-Mapstone et al. Um, and they're mainly based uh, in Australia, 
Um, but there's also uh, Kasia Benass, who um, used to work at Glasgow, actually, but now uh, works at the University of Edinburgh. Um, the paper is um, actually about teaching uh, sex and gender in it's in a biology course that, that covers genetics and so on. Um, but I think it's very, very relevant to the study um, of, of psychology and to teaching psychology because the, the line between biology and psychology uh, quite often uh, gets blurred. So the, the paper is about um, how they, um, how and why they decided to redesign their uh, curriculum to be more inclusive and the, the impact that that had. Just before I start going uh, over um, the paper, um, I just want to go through a few um, terms. Now, I decided to take the terminology from the Scottish Trans Alliance, because the Scottish Trans Alliance are a fantastic organisation uh, based here in Scotland. Um, there, are, there are terms, um, there's some definitions in the paper, um, but I wanted to big up the Scottish Trans because they do a lot of really good work. Um, and also uh, because um, sometimes terminology can differ between countries. So I thought it was best to, to present uh, the, the, the Scottish version. Um, and uh, I'm doing this just because I, not everybody in the, the audience may be uh, fully familiar with all of these terms. Um, so terminology, assigned sex at birth. So what this means is that when, uh, when a baby is born, uh, the doctor normally declares uh, it's a boy or it's a girl. Um, and, and that declaration is based on a visual inspection of uh, you know, uh, genitals. Um, uh, you can occasionally be, uh, you know, assigned as, as, as intersex, uh, but typically, you know, assigned sex at birth is what happens based, based on this visual inspection. Um, and uh, a baby is then expected to grow up into an adult who identifies as, as the gender that matches with their body. So a baby born uh, with a penis would be expected to grow up uh, and be a boy. So that's what I mean by a sex sign of birth. Uh, cisgender or a cis person is uh, a person who is not transgender. Um, so this is a person who identifies as their assigned uh, sex at birth. Um, and this is kind of the, uh, the, um, the, the pair with uh, transgender. So transgender um, is the uh, uh, inclusive umbrella term for anyone whose gender identity does not fully correspond with the sex that they were assigned at birth. Um, and the Scottish Trans Alliance take this umbrella approach, which is that uh, this uh, terminology of transgender can apply to trans men, trans women, and also non-binary people who do not identify with those kind of uh, gender binaries. Um, cisgender is, is um, I think it's a, it's a new word, well, certainly it's um, being used more commonly um, in the last few years, and there is sometimes a bit of a outcry against it. Um, and I think it's just it's it for me it's really, really interesting in that um, the the outcry against the use of cisgender to de describe kind of a majority of the population is basically it's the same outcry that happened when the word heterosexual uh, started being used uh, very um, uh, for the first time people didn't uh, like that as well it was this um, this thing of heterosexual is you know I, I don't need a label I I I am not heterosexual I am I'm normal and that's kind of the same. Uh, thing uh, so that the use of the word cisgender is important because it recognizes you know that it is you know there there is an alternative there is not just this this one way of being sorry I'm going off topic here I'm going to speed up a uh, non-binary person is a person uh, identifying is having uh, as either having a gender which is is somewhere between or beyond um, the the binary categories of man and woman or you can, you know, gender fluid, uh, which is where people kind of fluctuate between uh, man and woman, but it can also refer to a person uh, who has uh, no gender, uh, has no gender identity, either permanently or some of the time. Uh, trans man is a person who was assigned female at birth, but has a male gender identity and transitions to live as a man. Um, the term transsexual, uh, man or woman, is um, an outdated term, and uh, most um, trans people would uh, prefer you not to use that, that term. Uh, a trans woman, um, a person who is assigned male birth versus uh, female gender identity and therefore transitions to live uh, as a woman. Um, and then finally, uh, pronouns. So pronouns are the way someone refers to you. So um, the most commonly used pronouns 
are she, her, and hers, um, which is normally used for, for women, and he, him, his, uh, normally used for men. Um, some people, though, choose to use gender neutral pronouns, uh, such as using a singular they, them, or theirs, which has been grammatical for hundreds of years, despite what certain parts of the internet will tell you. Um, but there are also um, other alternatives like uh, Z and he and his, um, and some people um, uh, will use a mixture of pronouns. Um, uh, so Jude's saying in the chat, am I correct in thinking that uh, basically trans and man should be two separate words rather than one separate word? Uh, and yes, um, so uh, there should be two separate words because um, putting it all together as one word would kind of create it, it would be a new, it would be a noun, it would be a new noun, whereas it's a, it's an adjective, so it's trans man, but you know, man is the same man as every other man. Does, does that make sense? I don't think I explained that very, very well, but it should be two separate words. If anyone has a more sophisticated explanation of that difference, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, and then the other thing that's uh, really important uh, for this particular um, uh, paper is the distinction uh, between sex and gender. So sex is the biological and physiological characteristics that define male, female and intersex people. So this is things uh, like chromosomes um, and gender is the socially constructed roles, behaviours, activities and attributes that a given society considers appropriate for men, women uh, and non-binary people. Um, and the way that I explain this to my level twos, I think it is, is to think about kind of the different um, societal, the arbitrary societal expectations of gender that are just seemingly made up out of nowhere. So for example, if you think about hair length as, a, as an indicator of gender, in some societies, you know, short hair is seen as masculine, in some societies, short hair is seen as feminine and the other way around. If you think about skirts, um, in Scotland, in, in the UK, uh, men aren't supposed to wear uh, skirts. Um, if they're in England, but they're allowed to in Scotland, as long as they're made of tartan and there's a sporran on the front, are, you know, the, the things that make up the societal behaviours and, and roles and, and so on um, uh, are, are completely uh, arbitrary uh, in, in terms of this. And they are two very different things. Um, sex and gender are, are different concepts. Okay, so that was the world's most polished introduction to all of that. Um, so what I'm going to do now is, is go through uh, the paper and I just have kind of a, a slide on each section just for the main points, but please do put any questions you have in the chat and we'll come to them uh, at the end. So in terms of the background and rationale, um, in the introduction, they make, I think, a very good point um, that you know, we're often teaching from textbooks, particularly at these kind of uh, pre-honours level courses. Um, and of course, one of the problems is that it means that content can lag behind current genetic understanding. So the things that you're teaching might not actually be the up-to-date understandings um, of, of a number of different things. Um, and the issue that this has led to, particularly when it comes to you know, sex and gender, is that most of the teaching is still that biological sex is binary. And actually, there's a huge amount of research from genetics and so on. Um, you know, that you can have uh, an, an extra sex chromosome and that there is this huge range of, of intersex uh, people and characteristics. And then we also have a huge amount of um, psychological um, and sociological uh, research that, you know, shows that the, the idea of sex and gender um, being separate um, is, is kind of it's very much rooted in evidence and it has uh, it's also kind of cross-cultural uh, as well, and that certain conceptions of, of binary sex uh, and gender um, are more pervasive in certain uh, cultures in, in the West and so on. One of the issues um, uh, with all of this stuff is that um, when we teach this kind of uh, curriculum, part of the reason that that happens is because the staff, the teaching staff at universities who are teaching it, um, are predominantly white, cisgendered, heteronormative, um, and, and so on. Um, so there's just a lack of, you know, minority teaching staff in academia. 
which means you don't get the, the pace of social change that you might do if those people were represented. Um, and this has an impact on student learning and engagement. Um, you know, if you're a student seeing, you know, your, your identities omitted from, from histories, um, seeing, you know, what is now scientifically out of date concepts being taught will have uh, an impact and can lead to isolation and alienation and so on. And for those of you who are at the, the last reading uh, group, when we looked at that UCAS report, actually inclusive curriculum was, was one of the, the main things that students said made their time at school better was to see their identities reflected in what they were being taught. Um, the authors make the, the point that undergraduate biology subjects are in basically a really powerful position in terms of being able to um, incorporate uh, stuff into the curriculum that explains uh, sex and gender beyond uh, the binary, uh, particularly beyond the binary of what's taught uh, in traditional textbooks. So the purpose of the study was they aim to enhance and update their curriculum of their very large first year biology course. Um, so removing outdated and, and binary terminology and trying to integrate inclusive representations of sex and gender. So the research questions they were focused on was, you know, what concepts um, did they did students understand after being taught this new inclusive context? Um, what did they misunderstand? Did learning and attitudes differ uh, depending upon minority status or sex and gender of the students? Um, uh, and, and also uh, by, by international status as well. So the, the method of the paper, it was um, a large, uh, as I say, first year course. It's a University of Technology in Sydney. Um, it's a cell biology and genetics course, and it's from 2019, uh, and there are 292 students on the course. So a, a reasonably large uh, first year cohort. Um, so the partnership team, started with reviewing the content that was in the um, existing lecture um, that they had and then updating it and creating additional evidence-based content about biological sex, gender expression uh, and so on. Um, and I should also uh, make it clear here that one of the, the, the key points of this paper is that it was a staff-student partnership, so it was co-creation. So they had uh, a trans student um, as part of the team who were creating these materials. So the module, um, it was it was a 20 minute module that was delivered as part of a 90 minute lecture. Um, and it was about um, the, the lecture, the, the, the wider lecture was on introductory genetic concepts. Um, so it covered things like sex and gender identity being distinct constructs, that sex is a continuum. Um, that, you know, gender identity is a, a personal sense of, of one's own gender, uh, it's not fluid, it's not, uh, it is fluid, it can be fluid, it isn't binary, um, and it's a social construct, um, and, you know, it, as well as things like, you know, what gender expression is, and also what sexual orientation uh, is, um, and uh, we're going to come back to this in, in the discussion probably, but um, the, the lecture emphasised that, that these were um, not binaries, um, although these are the, um, uh, the, the, the scales uh, that they used, which they do acknowledge in the paper that they have um, basically the, the two ends to all of these, which, which doesn't quite work. So, for example, asexuality is not really represented on that sexual orientation time. But anyway, come back to that. That, that was what they, they did in terms of updating the curriculum. So they uh, gave students um, a quiz um, and uh, they found that students seemed to, on the whole, uh, understand uh, the content. Um, the quiz was very heavily skewed to the point where I do wonder if it's, um, <laughs> a, a useful measure, measure of discriminating uh, understanding. Um, but they also, they, they found no difference, no evidence of gender differences um, or um, differences between the understanding of, of domestic versus international uh, students on their understanding. So it looked like, you know, it wasn't that the content was um, only really being absorbed by a particular uh, group of students. 
Um, when it came to attitudes, so they did find that there was um, a difference in uh, attitudes whereby students who I said they were a part of a minority group were more positive about the module um, than those who said that they were not part of a minority group. So that was for attitudes overall. Uh, this figure is looking at um, their responses to each uh, individual question. You kind of see it, it, it changes depending on the question, but it, there is this overall effect uh, whereby minority students seemed more positive um, than the, the non-minority students. In terms of um, the student evaluations, they were largely positive. Um, so the, the students who, who came back and said, you know, it's great, please keep this in. It was relevant and it was scientifically presented, which I think is really good. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's good that future scientists will, will know this um, if they hadn't previously. On the flip side, there was also, um, you know, a few comments that were in the minority, but, you know, one that said, um, you know, gender identity has nothing to do with science. Why am I being taught about it in biology? It's, you know, completely legitimate, but I don't know why it's here. Um, and then there was one about how um, the distinction of gender and sex and um, the idea that sex and gender is, is more than a binary uh, goes against um, their beliefs. In terms of the discussion, so they, they argue that um, that these, uh, that the finding that students from the minority groups were more positive was a kind of a, a compensatory effect. So this kind of inclusive curriculum is even more beneficial from students from uh, minority backgrounds. And they argued that kind of doing, making these changes to the curriculum um, could lead to an increased sense of belonging. One of the issues though, was that it was felt that um, students really, appreciated the use of scientific evidence in order to, um, to, to to back this up, particularly when it came to the discussion of, you know, like chromosomes and intersex variations and so on. Um, but that they it was noted that the use of scientific evidence wasn't consistent. And this kind of led to a perception that the um, the the teaching about you know gender identity and gender expression was less based on evidence and the team do make uh, it clear that it's not that those things were not are not um scientifically substantiated but they maybe appeared to be because of the way uh, that we uh, they taught it um and they do also know and I, this is a, a point that i do want to bring up later that the lecturer who delivered the module was more comfortable teaching basically the, the kind of genetic component than they were talking about things like gender identity and so on um, um that they were worried about how it would be um uh, received and their expertise and that may have kind of led to them them not being as on board with the, the gender identity side as they were with the the kind of sex not being binary um, so this is actually from um, th these two paragraphs here. So the, the first paragraph here, this was a quote from the, the trans student who was a partner um, talking about the, you know, their experience of uh, working on the project um, and, and saying that, you know, they're hoping that the, the work will at least do something to help some of the difficulties trans and non-binary students uh, face. Um, and I really like this, the LGBTQ plus people should never be expected to advocate alone for their own rights, whilst also struggling with institutionalized discrimination and social ostracism. I think that the point the student was trying to make was that, you know, this has to come from everybody. It can't just be LGBTQ people fighting for themselves, that it has to be, you know, more widespread. Um, the, the second quote, the paragraph here is from uh, another author on the paper, but who is um, uh, a cis uh, heterosexual uh, white woman, um, she was one of the teachers um, and was saying that um, she felt that she couldn't relate to the concepts, so she therefore felt underqualified, um, but that actually, you know, taking part in the project made her realise, you know, 
what does it mean to be uh, an ally um, and that, you know, being an ally is not about demonstrating compassion, but about using my privilege to help create space for people with experiences different from my own. I promise you I'm nearly finished with this presentation. Um, and, and the authors uh, note that the, the approach of using this um, staff student partnership and this co-creation approach allowed us to create what they call brave spaces. So staff and students could learn from each other, they could make mistakes and they could draw on kind of experiential um, and their subject uh, expertise. And that was what made the project successful. So there are two key conclusions were really that um, the students are more likely to understand and retain this knowledge if they were taught scientifically. So embedding gender inclusive content within the home discipline, and you know that goes for whether or not it's biology or psychology, but if it's embedded within the discipline and it's evidence-based that students respond to it positively. Um, and their second um, conclusion was that students from minority background perceive the content more uh, positively than their non-minority counterparts, um, suggesting that there is this kind of compensatory effect, so it's even more beneficial. Okay, so that is my, again, highly polished uh, summary of this, um, of, of this paper. So these are the questions I care. To, anyone who normally comes to the reading group will understand that that actually was quite polished for me. <laughs> um, so these are the discussion questions and I'm going to read them out um, whilst you are all thinking, but please do either raise your hands um, or type your question uh, in, in the chat. Um, so uh, things that came to mind, First of all, I'd be really interested of hearing your experience of, of developing or teaching or studying uh, for, the, for the students we've got here, inclusive curricula. Um, and given that this is the Tile Network, um, we might also um, have some you know, high school teachers and so on. It'd be really interesting to hear from you. Um, my second question was how comprehensive were the materials that they created? For me, there were a few things I felt were missing, but I suppose then the question is, how comprehensive can they be, you know, in, in what, is, what is possible? A third question, how do we empower allies to teach outside of their experience? You know, I am not trans. I teach trans stuff in, in my, you know, level two. I am, you know, a white woman. I teach, like, how do we empower people to, to, to teach beyond their experience? Um, Question four, how can staff student partnerships be meaningfully included in the curriculum development given workload constraints? We've got a lot to do on this. If we were to take this approach with everything, it would never get done. How, how do we do it in a realistic way? Um, what does uh, the impact, uh, in what way does the impact of inclusive uh, curriculum generalize? So um, yeah, Lisa's already said like, when they said minority students who, what, what do they mean by a minority? It's not clear. But, you know, like, for example, do we get the same effects if we teach about race? Do we get the same kind of broadening, you know, effects of inclusion? And then finally, what concrete changes could we make to our curricula? You know, if we go away from here today, what's your one thing where you're like, OK, I could do this one thing differently in my course? That is all of the questions that I came up with. It's a lot of questions. It is, I know, but I just like, <laughs> basically, if anyone would like to um, speak to any of them, I'm aware I've just spoken for a very long time. <laughs> I have a question, actually, uh, in regards to the paper uh, that I did not read, sorry. Um, but I had a question in regard to the paper. How did they... Um, explain the rationale for, for doing what they did to the students. So how was it embedded? Um, how was it communicated to them? Um, that is an excellent question. <laughs> I'm just gonna go and get, get the paper <laughs> and uh, figure it out. Sorry, but Lizzie, you can you can go go ahead with your um, hi, hello, sure. <laughs> Um, I don't know if I have any answers to the specific discussion questions, um, but some thoughts that I had when I was reading over the paper, um, I really liked that they collaborated with a student. Um, mm -hmm. 
because I feel like maybe some um, people would avoid doing that for a kind of like superiority thing. Um, but I really liked that they involved a student and um, obviously the fact that they were queer was really important. Um, I really liked that they were so um, research heavy and kind of made a point to use current literature in their field because I mean, as we've already said, you know, a textbook from like five years ago can be out of date today. Um, I really don't see a point in textbooks, but <laughs> yeah. So I'm a big fan of like the research-based teaching. Um, and I like that they made their motivations very clear for their research, because I feel like that's extremely important um, when you're doing anything to do with like LGBT stuff. Um, it's very important to have clear motivations as to why you want to do it and stuff like that. Um, as Emily said, when I was looking at the um, that kind of like linear de uh, depictions of the um, different uh, concepts like biological sex and stuff. Yeah, I wasn't, I also wasn't a big fan of these. <laughs> I feel like it's very difficult though to visualize what a spectrum looks like. Um, so I feel like they might have just been better off not including this figure. Um, because even if you include it as a circle, it kind of implies this kind of boundary. Whereas I feel like our understanding of these concepts is much more broad and stuff. Um, so that was like one thing I didn't like as much. Um, I feel like the negative feedback they got from students, um, which was obviously very from a kind of significant minority, I think it was like six people who complained about it, they said. Um, it, it kind of gave me the impression that the person maybe didn't understand the concept of what science is. Because um, when they were kind of talking about it not being objective and fact-based, I really don't like using as a, a scientist, well, psychologist, but um, I don't like when people use the term like fact or proved something. Because obviously with research, our understanding is changing constantly. Um, and this kind of, it kind of leaves no room for kind of, um, yeah, developing these concepts and learning more. So I feel like that might have contributed to that kind of criticism of the whole module and stuff in addition to their beliefs, obviously, as well. Um, and lastly, my last thought, um, I kind of agreed with the students' criticisms that gender was perhaps less relevant to biology um, and what they were talking about with genetics. Um, I don't think this is necessarily a negative thing because I think it's good to establish that gender and sex are different in this concept, in this um, context, because um, obviously as a society, I feel like the majority of people still believe that sex and gender is the same thing, um, mostly from just like, not knowing about this topic, I think. Um, so I feel like it's good that they clarified that. But it kind of implies that maybe there's space um, as psychologists and as especially social psychologists, that this is our area that we can kind of like talk about gender. Um, and it kind of says, if they've kind of been able to shift views on biological sex in their module and kind of get that kind of up-to-date research, that's also something we can do as psychologists when we talk about gender and teach courses on gender. Um, so yeah, those were kind of my thoughts <laughs> as I was reading through the paper and I wanted to share those. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, the, uh, I was just looking it up in the paper there. There is no, it doesn't look like they did introduce it to the students. Um, uh, aside like with the, the co-creation thing and I think that maybe speaks to, to Lizzie's point about the um uh like the, the what am I saying the fact that the fact that it wasn't um the fact that it wasn't introduced probably reduced the kind of like the you know why are we learning about this mm. and the, you know the, the link with the science and, and so on I feel like I've missed the point anyway Lisa <laughs> 
Um, I, I just wanted to pick up on a few of the things that Lizzie had said about um, like the, or that were mentioned in general about like the person who was giving the module wasn't super comfortable with all of the material, especially it sounded like most of the stuff around gender identity, which she seemed to be teaching as very separate from biology, which I think like, here's where you fall down if, if you don't have any sort of expertise. There's a bit broader um, ideas in the literature, things about um, that gen gender itself being a social construct and that the idea of having long hair, being feminine, being a, a, something that's restricted to a certain place and time and not going to be replicated. But gender identity itself, like your sense of gender in yourself isn't necessarily not biological. If we found a brain signature for it, we'd be all over claiming it's biological, right? Um, and so this sort of like hard and fast distinction between the things that are biological and the things that aren't biological is also a bit wigglier than I think what they're portraying here. Um, but I think that requires the people who are teaching it to actually, um, like that's an understanding I've come to after reading a whole lot of relevant papers. So I think trying to get an overview from, you know, the level of a level two undergraduate doing some research and trying to say what's the state of the art, like might not be good enough in topics like this. I, I can understand why the instructors feel like they're afraid they're going to make a misstep. They don't know everything. And it takes a lot of time to become an expert in an area. Um, and the consequences of getting it wrong here, like everything you taught in an intro course is like a little bit not exactly what's going on because the people teaching it, they can't, they can't know to a deep level every single area in their topic. Um, but when it's um, a topic that's as important as this, I think the consequences of getting it wrong are worse and then people are more nervous. So how do we, how do we tackle that? Because the, the answer isn't nobody teaches it unless that's their core area. Yeah, it, it's, it's such an interesting point and I, I, I don't have an, an answer to this. Um, I'm going to stop talking and uh, Sarah. really have an answer for that either but something that I appreciate a lot is when like lecturers actually are quite open with like oh I'm not an expert in this either we're learning about this together so if you know more or you have like a knowledge about this please share it and that kind of thing of making education more of like a, a conversation rather than like like a one-way thing um because like that always makes it feel a bit more like oh okay it's all right to say something and to make a mistake in this situation and you're going to be corrected on it and therefore you're actually learning rather than feeling like oh I don't even know what I'm saying as also like obviously it's a bit more weighty with like if you're teaching something and you say something that could negatively affect a student in terms of feeling like alienated or whatever because of uh, it affecting them negatively but being open and honest about it I think at least for me like when people are open and honest about things like that it makes it feel a little bit more like oh okay we're all learning here and I don't know if that makes any sense to anyone else but that's my wee thing about that. <laughs> Carolina do you have uh, no, I, I'm just wondering if Lizzie wants to add something because your hand is still up, so I wasn't. <laughs> no, I completely forgot to put it down. Oh, I'm no, on my fine. phone, so it's really difficult to like navigate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think it's, it's such a yeah. It, it's it's as, as a teacher, it's reassuring to hear a student say that. Um, I I teach um, yeah, I I teach uh, cognitive sex differences and then and gender and uh, things at, at level two. And I probably know a lot more than the average person on the street, but I find those lectures terrifying to give because I think I've possibly reached that point of knowledge where I'm aware of the nuances or I'm aware of like 
what I could say that's wrong. Like even you know in this presentation, I pulled the um the the definitions at the start from the Scottish Trans Alliance so that I could use the wording you know used by the Scottish like and and even then, I convinced I probably said something that's that's wrong. Um, and I, I I suppose it's how how do we get to that place whereby we can empower people to learn to, to actually do the work it takes because I'm not saying people shouldn't do the work it takes but then also if it's not 100% right how do we do that in a way that doesn't then make them go I'm just not going to do this it's too, it's too terrifying I, the problem here and it's is the nature of the topic it's like with vaccines if you want to talk about vaccinations to a class, now you know there's going to be some people who are um, unwilling to believe you and going to nitpick or try to give you disinformation. So you can't have that discussion in the same way you could have a discussion about protein folding and then at the next class say, oh, oops, I got that fact wrong. That's, no, that's now, like the consequences are much worse. Can I just add something? Um, because I think one thing that is really important um, is to know that someone like Emily, who has read a lot about the topic, right, um, and knows um, the community, to know that even you are sometimes struggling to get it right. So it's a, it's kind of this thing. It, it kind of takes the pressure off because you kind of everyone is still in the process and you can always learn more and develop your kind of skills in, in that regard. And just knowing this makes kind of, um, I think it makes a huge difference. And I think, I wish probably maybe if I, if I open my eyes, I could, and actually pay attention to this, I could see more and more people actually admitting that, you know, it is a difficult, um, um topic to talk about or to get it right and i'm still struggling to actually have that kind of this openness about that because it helps everyone else right so um i like to um, think about the example when um when my six-year-old son asked about um what what a transgender uh, no about different flags so about um the LGBT uh, flag and the transgender flag and 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 we both looked at each other because it was me sitting at the table, Emily was sitting at the table, and then he asked this question, and I saw kind of panic in Emily's face. <laughs> okay, how do never I explain the flags to a six-year-old? <laughs> <laughs> how do I do this? And then I kind of okay, I, I'm going to try. I'm I'm going to try this. But as I was explaining it to him, I always had like this. I always looked at Emily like, okay, am I doing the right thing? <laughs> So um, wonderful, a baby cry. <laughs> but um, the kind of thing that you you know, it, just the awareness to have that it is something that um, everyone is kind of trying to do to do their best um, when they when they start getting involved with with, with the topic and um, talking about it. I think that would be helpful. It's maybe linked to the idea of um, it how do we meaningfully do staff student partnerships which is maybe the meaningful bit is we we say like one of the things that is is maybe less obvious to when I'm teaching is that I do have I do have conversations with students some of them are here I do have you know messages and stuff when I do check in with my trans students that you know was that was there anything that I said I shouldn't have done and stuff like that maybe being more open about the fact that that is happening or having, a, I, I don't know, um, yeah, making that a, like the feedback loop of we are teaching these things. I might not get it 100% right, but I'm trying. And, and, and I, I, I don't know, sorry, Sarah. Um, I do think that it's quite obvious when like lecturers know, like when, or at least when people know or at least are trying to understand more about things because you can just see in the way that they approach it they don't approach it with I feel like people who know more approach it with more caution because they understand the gravity of it and people who know less approach it with less caution because they're like oh it's like whatever and part of that is like this whole conversation of how do you like approach it 
isn't a conversation that people will have if they don't like think about it that much of it being quite a big thing so like especially like I've sat in lectures and been like oh I feel like like this person may not actually fully understand what they're talking about here and that's okay um because we're all learning uh but there are definitely times I've sat in lectures and been like oh yeah no they're 100% speaking from things that they've experienced or it from like a place of quite a lot of knowledge and I think you can tell as a student like where that lies um or at least I can tell as a student where that lies sometimes um because it just feels very different I don't know if that's helpful <laughs> Oh, that is, it is it is very helpful thank you so much um yeah i mean and i, I think it's you know the, the reality of teaching is sometimes you are teaching things that is your expertise sometimes you're teaching things that is you know in your broad wheelhouse but isn't you know you, you're absolutely it, it's 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 just what our jobs are um but it is yeah it's it's scary uh at, at times um are there any, I, I know there's, there's quite a few students with us today. Um, are there any ideas not to put this all on you? <laughs> but, you know, do you, for, you know, in, in the chat, for example, are there other things, you know, what concrete things could we do? So um, we teach, you know, obviously we, we've, we've put this in, um, there's, uh, we've tried to put stuff in about, you know, the, the history of psychology in first year, we've put things in in, in second year, both the uh, developmental lectures, the individual difference lectures, just the, the LGBT reading group, um, and so on, you know, uh, and we've tried to make like the data skills examples, you know, we don't use binary gender as a, as a variable um, where we can, can avoid it and so on. Like, in terms of concrete, what, what could you do, Lisa? Oh, say, and in level three physiology, there is a section on behavior genetics and sex gender diversity. My knowledge of the curriculum stops at level two. <laughs> I, I went on one level two MSc, it was like, it's a mystery, level three and four. Um, yeah, but I'm just gonna have a look at the, uh, yeah. Um, Are there any? No, I, I feel like this, the chat is. Oh, hang on. Uh, they're making sure that all the lectures teaching about gender are on the same page is important. I can see how the way more confusing when different lecturers use different terminology. Um, yeah, I, 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 I see that. I do see that. I also see the the reality of how we're doing our teaching behind the scenes, which is what causes the issue um of yeah. Lisa do you have a also like researchers are just terrible for terminology somebody was trying to look at like what do people call mixed effects models and there's like 18 different things that people call them so sometimes you know your lecturers might be using different terminology because there's different subfields actually use this terminology and it's important for you to know um, if you think they're using like outdated terminology for groups of people definitely let let them know um, or let other like safe staff members know that maybe this person needs to be updated. And if they're using offensive terminology, meaning to be offensive, then of course report that. But um, specific terminology does differ a lot between subfields. Emily. Sorry. Um, just a quick thing, um, because obviously I'm first year, so I'm coming into this pretty new. Um, the most important thing I would say for learning is the safe space thing, because I think in psychology, it's very, people know they can't say things. So it's more like, yeah, okay, you're here to listen and that's it. But like, I do like biology as well. And I would feel scared to say something to a lecturer because I would feel like, I'd be very much on my own with that kind of thing. So I we feel all like, desperately want you to talk to us. <laughs> yeah, psychology very much do, but um, there's a lot of kind of and other subjects. But yeah, so I think the safe space thing and like making it very clear that this is a kind of 
learning environment and I don't know where I'm going with this, but yeah, basically that. Lizzie. Um, yeah, I was going to say that I completely agree with that. Um, obviously, I don't go to Glasgow. I don't do my bachelor's at Glasgow, um, but I did do my bachelor's at UEA, where I am now. And I can remember like multiple times wanting to say something, but I think because of the lecturer that I had, um, the fact that you're with lots of other people when you don't know how they'd respond, if you make a comment about something to do with gender, or sexuality you're instantly like outing yourself <laughs> and like putting the attention on you and if you if the lecturer doesn't have the right kind of vibe then you, you kind of don't feel comfortable saying something to them even like in private um so I feel like it, it's important to make it clear that you're very open to kind of feedback in that sense um and I think making sure that lecturers aren't kind of critical of things that they maybe don't understand fully or concepts they're not familiar with um because <laughs> I remember I had like a stats class once in my second year and I'd abbreviated I included non-binary as a gender option which is quite rare I feel um although more common I see it more common now which makes me really happy whenever I see an article that has non-binary as an option um but I'd abbreviated it to NB um the letters and he was like what does mb stand for and he was like oh whatever and like i didn't feel comfortable to be like oh it stands for non-binary kind of thing um so i i feel like that would be important as well but that was kind of my experiences of it and when i didn't want to you know, speak out about things and stuff yeah i think that's a super important point i think um that where um alice come in um who are um like, like like me, for example, right? I'm not in the LGBT community, but I, I make make an effort to point exactly those things out, yeah? So if I see that they are using just it's um, binary um, pronouns in an official document, I make sure to provide feedback that they should use the, the they and more um, kind of open um, pronouns in there. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's really important to grow um, a, a good body of allies who who do that work um, as well, because um, it should not be just um, people in the community, in the LGBT community, um, to to do the the heavy work um, to educate others. So we need others who um, who can who can do the same kind of um, work. So um, yeah, I think that's really important um, to to kind of grow this kind of um, culture in, in that regard. So I, th I think two of the things that are, so I think um, Lisa's saying, what are ways for lecturers to convey that they're safe to talk to? I think pronouns in your Zoom name or your email, because it's just, it's that signal that you are aware of, you know, uh, you know that the, I think it's, it's, it's a really easy signal of awareness um, in, in a more kind of, it's very Glasgow specific, but, um, the, so we do rainbow office hours if you're, if you're not from Glasgow. So um, for into coming out day and there was another day in the second semester, um, queer members of staff hold rainbow office hours. And we've do, been doing this for a few years and it's been um, very well received. Um, mainly, it's, they're not actually that much, uh, well attended, but it's the, the representation. It's, you know, pe people putting themselves out there as, as these people. Um, and I am very happy to, to say that I've been talking to the LGBT staff network and the transitions group, and that will be rolling out institutionally for uh, History Month in February. So um, I'm hopeful that we'll get volunteers on board from across the institution in all colleges so that we can start to show where the lecturers are that you know are, are part of the community um because it's it's one of those things that i think representation is such a uh, an important um important thing um yeah i am very very aware of the time um carolina did you want to yes um I know if there's if there are any other questions, uh, we oh, um, can also just um, unshare the screen if if you like, Emily. Oh, yeah. uh, and then we can actually see each other. And um, 
I can also just stop the recording now. Um, this I'm going to just to wrap up. Thank you very much for this, and thank you for the presentation, Emily, and for all the input from everyone who uh, wrote in the chat, who um, asked question on camera, or who just listened um, and uh, not at all. Um, along. Um, we will have this recording up uh, on our Tile Network uh, website uh, for everyone to, to watch. And I'm going to stop the recording.